Hello everyone, welcome back to part 2 of this week-long series on the Watts, Chris Watts and what he did to his wife and two daughters, an unborn son. Yesterday in part 1 we talked about how everything started, the 911 call why Nicole was so worried about his, uh, you know, her friend and uh, why Chris looked very suspicious from the beginning by not paying attention to the concerns of Nicole that she only thought that maybe Shannon had a either an accident or some kind of a diabetic related issue and uh, yeah I mean those were valid reasons to concern any husband and it didn't so today we're going to talk about what the police found in the GPS and that's where we left yesterday we're also going to talk about how Shanann and Chris met what he told the police when he was questioned for the very first time and a lot more that will help us get into kind of the ending, the saddest ending ever for a family and a little bit beyond the ending because for the girls and for Nico They're not here anymore, but uh, Chris is, and sadly he's a very popular guy apparently, but uh, we'll talk about that later on. Now, when the question, while they were asking for the records of where the GPS was, remember that the truck that Chris was driving was a company truck so they needed to ask for the records and see where it was where it stopped and all those details that this kind of GPS would tell the police to kind of um, compare with the story that he was giving them because initially, um, Chris told the police that they recently came back from a trip to North Carolina. They actually made it back home on August 7th. Chris and Shannon were both from North Carolina and their families lived there. Now, this trip wasn't a happy old trip with a family. This wasn't a let's go visit family and uh, be happy all together. No, yeah, no. This trip was very long. Later on, we will learn that it was planned as a six-week trip, trip and that actually Chris was going to join in the very last week. So, I'll talk about that trip and I'll explain why it's kind of an interesting trip as well. On the 10th, Shanann had a work trip. So, this is what Chris is telling the police. They came back on the 7th, Shanann had a trip on the 10th, and she was going to Arizona for work with the company Thrive. Chris tells the police that she came back at 1.40 a.m. on Monday night. She arrived later than she should have because she, her flight was delayed. He said that he was sleeping in their bedroom and he ended up, which by the way, was he assuming that he came back at 1.40 because of the 
cameras or did he wake up and pretended that he was sleeping and continued to sleep because he was tired and needed to go to work? Well, then he said that uh, he woke up at 4 a.m. and started to have a rather deep conversation. He later on described it as, quote-unquote, an emotional conversation, something along those lines. But I think it's one of the most popular clips that you can find of Chris saying that. Now, he, he said in that very first uh, interview or questioning that they were talking about selling the house and getting a divorce and uh, he said that they had this conversation for about 30 minutes he also made a point to say that they were not arguing that it was a polite but emotional conversation he also said that this was not a, uh, oh, hey, wake up, it's 4 a.m., let's talk about divorce. He said that they've been talking about this for weeks. Now, in my head, you know, it seemed like the guy, or the, well, the person in this conversation pushing that idea was Chris. And later on you'll understand, but well, I'll explain a little bit of the relationship that they had, but it was almost like Jeanette didn't want to hear it. According to all this, of course, I wasn't there, but uh, according to all the statements and all what, you know, how people described Shannon and how people described Chris as a laid back kind of chill guy. And Shannon was a little bit more OCD and she was a little bit more strict and she needed routines and she was kind of a type A personality that I'll go into it in just a few minutes. But uh, it almost felt, it feels like to me, anyways, that. He was the one pushing it. He was the one that probably noticed that she was awake and started that conversation. Like, he wanted to get that done. It was almost like she was ignoring him. Or at least that's what it seems like once he and other people start to share what really was going on in their relationship that was so well hidden. Now... At 5.27 a.m., this is what they could find from the truck, okay? So now while they were interrogating Chris and continued the investigation, the things from the GPS came back and um, it pointed out that at 5.27 a.m., yes, he did in fact turn on the truck and we all know that he backed up his truck to the garage to load tools according to him it also says that the car or the truck left the house at around 5 45 a.m now he told the police that um shenan was in bed at that time and that he went home to be alone for a few hours now, in case you didn't know, um, he worked for a very, I mean, very big company, oil company. Yeah, this is Andarco Petroleum Corporation. And he worked on oil wells. He said, that, well, he said that Janan was planning to spend the day at a friend's house and not sure whose house great. I mean, that's the kind of husband you have. I mean, the guy is, she was going somewhere with a friend, but not sure where. When he starts, well, while he continues to give his statement, I mean, the guy was married 
to Shinan for six years. He wanted to kind of blame himself for having that conversation with her, almost like he was insinuating that she probably left him with the girls. And because of having that emotional conversation, which by the way, to an officer that does this for a living, it really, that's not what they're thinking. All their medicine is there, their money, driver's license, SUV. This is not a mother that left the husband with the girls. It doesn't point to that direction. However, during that interview with Chris, that's what he was pointing out and insinuating to the police. Now, at the same time, while he was being interviewed and blaming himself for Shanann leaving him with the girls, you know, taking the girls away from him, I should say, he said that, but you can see in his face and the way that he is moving and that he, he's not feeling that. He seems very calm um, and this is not the behavior that you expect from a father that thinks that his wife took his girls and that knows that they have no medicine that they desperately need. It's a life or death situation over here. And he is all calmly talking about how his wife probably left him and how he was the one to blame for it. He also made a point to tell the police three different times that he left the garage door open. And that later on, he got the alert. And at around 12.40, so after um, uh, lunchtime, I think that's what it was referred to, he... It's th- this is where things are going to start to sound crazy because I'm not I'm not the one making this thing us up. I mean, you can tell that this wasn't a very well rehearsed answer. Um, he said that he left the garage door open. He emphasized that three times, and he said that he he had to. I don't know. What is it? Is it? Uh, he basically uh, removed the alarm. Okay. Now, I don't understand why. Was it because it was triggering because the garage door was open and every time a leaf or something went inside, it was triggering it? Was it because, I mean, you would want to have your alarm on, right? If you left the door open, at least you have the alarm. But Nicole was there and the door and the garage the garage door was was closed, remember? And not the police or Nicole could get inside. So why would he lie about leaving the garage door open? Now, at this point, Chris stayed a night with a friend neighborhood in, in the neighborhood. But they reported, even the friends, and these are Chris's friends, not, you know, just neighbors. They reported to the police that he was acting very strange. They just couldn't put their finger on it, but this wasn't the same guy. This was not the chill friend that they had and who was going through a horrible situation. There was no sadness, no crying, no anything. Not the normal kind of behavior you expect from a father that is missing his family. Now, when they questioned the neighbors, um, another neighbor reported that Chris was... um, And and this was in a few incidents. um, 
this wasn't like an everyday thing, but they did hear once or twice Chris yelling to Shannon or at Shannon. Now, at this point, the police gets a call from Shannon's mom and she asks to please check on Chris. I mean, the mother had a gut feeling. She even mentioned the idea of, che of checking the GPS in his truck, which the police already was on it. But now we have Chris's friends and family member saying that they needed to check on him. He was acting very oddly and... They, they just couldn't put a finger... I mean... Listen. Shanann's family loved Chris. They had a lot of friends. And they could only describe Chris as a great guy. A good father. A good friend. Why were they pointing to his direction then? At this point, the police asked Chris to check the activity in the bank account just to see if Shannon was using any of the credit cards or taking any kind of cash from their bank account. And here is where everything, it starts to reveal a little bit of their relationship. He says that he has no password, but he will call the banks to find out if there was any activity. He said that he didn't know which cards she carried around or where she kept her passport. Shannon was the one that handled the finances. She was the one that knew every single password. And pretty much he just went with it. At this point, Shannon was being missed a lot, actually. She was not only missed by her family and friends, but uh, they were a very popular family on social media that they included their lifestyle in different Facebook lives that they would do, almost like blogging their family life. Of course, they were promoting their products, kind of a like teamwork, they seemed happy. But I, after watching some of those Facebook lives, uh, Shannon was very real in them. Um, you could see her a personality coming through immediately. You could tell that she was the alpha in their relationship. And um, it was like there was... There, there was a few uh, videos where you could see that. Like one of them was the one where she tells Chris on a video that uh, she's pregnant, and the way that she said it, like almost. Uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to put things in your head, but watch the video if you're interested. And and he said something like i can't remember his exact words so i guess when you really want something like when she really wanted something things happen um almost like he didn't want her to be pregnant but there's a lot that you can tell from those lives i mean shenan was a real person she was very real she couldn't hide how she was feeling there was another instance where Chris was kind of pointing the dog's face towards the camera and Shannon was like, what are you doing to, th are you choking the dog or? It was said later on that she belittled Chris, which if you're thinking that I'm defending the guy, there's not, ex the, the, there's not an excuse in this world that will excuse this guy from what he did. I am just trying to share with you the details in their relationship that were later on shared in different part of the trial. Now, 
Shannon and Chris met through Facebook, even though they both lived in North Carolina. They met in 2010. Shannon was already divorced by then and a year older than Chris. And uh, apparently Shannon was kind of down after her divorce and Chris sent her a friend request. She ignored him, then he sent it again and a friend said, you know, he's a, you know, cool guy. Just give him a chance. She accepted. He messaged her. That's how they started the relationship. Shannon had some serious health issues and um, she had lupus, she had uh, fibromyalgia, migraines. And according to Shannon friends at the time, he was a very considerate guy and understood her health issues. He was very sweet about it. He wanted to not only spend time with her because he was, I mean, he fell in love with this girl. He loved her. And uh, you could tell by knowing that his parents absolutely despised Shanann. They, they didn't like her at all. But he was so head over heels with her that smitten by her that he just, he just couldn't. So their relationship was a very, you know, very intense they started dating and things got serious at this point. Chris was uh, working as a mechanic in a Ford dealership and uh, Shanann also worked there, uh, but she worked in the sales department. Finally, in 2012, they decided to get away <laughs> and they got married and moved to Colorado very expensive part of Colorado too. <laughs> in 2015, Chris got the job with the oil company while Shanann worked in a school. Then she worked in a, a kids hospital and she finally started working her own business with Thrive. They both needed to work, okay? This wasn't like um, a perfect um, situation where what he made was more than enough to support the family. They bought this huge house, beautiful, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's it's a really beautiful home. It's $400,000, probably more than that, but you know, in that range. And they needed to keep it up, you know? The, they used a lot of credit cards and according to some close people, they, it cut out of control. So they had to file for bankruptcy in 2015 or around that time. Shannon was described as a wonderful person, but a little controlling, as I mentioned before. And OCD. The kids were in a tight schedule, and uh, Chris wasn't okay with the idea, but he still went with it. He understood that for Shannon, it was very important to have a structure and to have a rule, to have rules and a way of doing things. Now Chris was using Thrive, and he was also again in those little social media videos that they made. He, in the beginning of 2018, he went on a diet. He started running, exercising. He went from 245 pounds to 185. He became a very fit guy, muscular. Um, and he was promoting their products, their Thrive products. He was wearing a patch. You could see that they this was a teamwork that they were doing. And that's a little bit behind the scenes of the dynamics of this family. But we need to go back to August uh, 13. Now, at this point, Remember that her family, well, her mom and 
the her friends were asking for the police to check on Chris. They even asked to please check his phone, his computer. Now, Jeremy and David, who were Chris's uh, friend, were friends, uh, they went to his house to check on their friend on that day. And one of the things that they mentioned that really pushed the idea that they needed to look into Chris or the police needed to look into Chris was the fact that once they got there, they were expecting a crying guy, a sad person, or showing some kind of, I don't know, some kind of emotion. But they found the guy vacuuming the house. Now, some people pointed to the fact that since Shanann was so clean and OCD and so controlling as far as the routines and getting things done, um, that uh, he wanted to make sure that the house looked good for when she came back. But we all know that that's not what he was probably thinking. However, some people explained at the time that that could be the why he was doing it. After that first night that he spent with, you know, with his friends, he said that he wanted to go back home because he wanted to be there in case that the girls came back. Uh, again, one of the nights he stayed with his friends and the other one he stayed at the house. And police would call him to ask him questions like sometimes in the middle of the night. And this is according to the police. But he would answer, I mean, he would answer the questions, but he would never ask, do you have any news about the girls? Did you find something? And I think that is safe to assume that most of the time, when you have a, a, a father or any person that is missing his family and you get a call in the middle of the night and what do you expect to hear, right? We found them. Or we found something. And it, it, it according to the officer, I mean, it, it almost seemed like he was like, hello, how can I help you? You know, that kind of attitude. I think that they were expecting him to say, Hello, oh, hello, did you find my my wife? Did you find my daughters? Are they okay? Do you have any leads? Do you have something pointing you somewhere? But really, he wouldn't ask for them. So now we have the fact that the guy is cleaning the house. He's not looking sad or depressed. He's not showing on... Um, TV news like a grieving father or husband. He's not even showing himself as a worried person. I can I can assure you that there were people in that neighborhood that were more worried about Shanann and the girls than this guy was. Now, if you know the end of the story, you probably are thinking, well, because he knew what happened to the girls. But how, I mean, he, if he planned the whole thing, why wasn't he showing any kind of emotion? It doesn't make sense at this point. But join me tomorrow, because tomorrow we're going to talk about the footage that National TV got and shared. And how he acted when he saw Shanann getting in the house when he went through the surveillance video with his neighbor and with the police. I mean, at this point, the police is going to need a warrant and that's when it happens. They will start to find some 
things related to the beds in different places where it really didn't belong. They would go through his phone and find interesting searches. And I don't know. It, 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 it just gets a little bit deeper before we get to what happened that night. It's, it's sad to go through the last weeks, the last month, the last hours of Shanann, her girls, and her son Nico, but uh, I think this is a story that needs to be, you know, that, that needs to be out there for people to see the signs, for people to see when you know, this kind of thing, you don't expect it. I'm sure that the way that Shanann had that relationship with Chris, she would not expect him to act violently. How this, how did this chill guy, this laid-back husband, sweet, loving friend, father, what happened? Did he snap? Did he plan the whole thing? Was this some kind of impulse? Well, little by little with all the information, it will add up to what happened that night. Or what he claims that happened. That physical evidence can really corroborate so join me tomorrow for part three and as we get closer to Friday where we're going to talk about who Chris Watt is really and uh, the different theories of what people think he is and I'll give you my own so thanks for being here today if you're watching this in the future there will be a playlist linked down below in the comments where you can click on it and watch this series from the beginning and you just can go back to back and uh, get to the end of the story thank you so much again for being there guys and i will talk to you guys tomorrow for part three <laughs>